Good evening. My name is Dr. Mark Brandon. I'm a member of the board of the Prince Adult School. I welcome all of you here tonight on kind of a rainy and dreary February night, so thank you for coming out. I also uh, am a retired physician in town and uh, practiced here for uh, all my professional life. I've known our speaker uh, for um, over a dozen years now that, uh, that he's been in Princeton, and so it's really a, an honor and a pleasure for me to be able to introduce um, Mr. Barry Radner. When the committee started thinking about the, this course on medicine, what we wanted to do was to make it a, a, a course broad enough to interest many people and to highlight different areas of medicine, uh, medicine now and medicine in the near future in America as things are changing. Last week you heard the doc, Dr. Margaret Mansfield, the uh, well-respected former practitioner of medicine here in, in town. And, and tonight we're very fortunate to have uh, the CEO of, of our hospital uh, association to talk to you about the areas of medicine that are related to the hospital. And as you've seen by looking at the uh, itinerary, or the, not the, itinerary, the, the schedule of speakers, uh, we're trying to get the uh, people who have uh, expertise in many different fields related to medicine, including the economics of medicine, the uh, Affordable Care Act, um, some issues about uh, decision making towards the end of life, and, and other areas. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got just a, a wonderful uh, setup on, on uh, people coming. Um, Heather Howard, whom many of you know because she's a member of Princeton uh, Council, or Township Council, is speaking next week on health care in the 2016 election, so hopefully uh, you'll all be able to attend uh, her lecture. But for tonight, uh, let me get to why you're all here. Uh, Barry Ratner is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Princeton Healthcare System. Um, and that's a lot more than just the hospital. Uh, you might think, if I'm not mistaken, that the organization has presidents in each of the areas, or at least Vice Presidents of the area, so uh, Barry is the uh, CEO of the entire group. I couldn't think of a person better knowledgeable or, or better to speak to us about uh, the area of, of how the hospital care is currently going on, how it's going to be affected in the near future. Um, the Prison Health Care System is a not-for-profit organization that includes the university a medical center of Princeton, now at Plainsboro. Of course, many of you, myself included, um, have known it at, at, at Witherspoon Street address for, uh, for many decades, but now, of course, it's over in Plainsboro. And I think since 2012 it's been opened. But besides the hospital, there are other entities which use the CEO, which provide behavioral health, rehabilitation, and home care services. The healthcare system also operates fitness and wellness centers, uh, surgical outpatient uh, and endoscopy units, uh, imaging, and clinical lab and behavioral health outpatient centers. The, uh, the whole system has 401 beds, some 3,000 employees, a medical staff now of 1,100 doctors, and 45 residents who train here in Princeton. These are residents and medical students who come from uh, Rutgers Medical School, Robert Wood Johnson, and we are also very fortunate in the future of this lecture series to have the newly appointed Dean of Robert Wood Johnson of Rutgers Medical School as one of our speakers, so hopefully you really uh, try hard to come to that lecture. Um, the uh, annual operating budget is approximately $400 million dollars and the organization ranks among the top 5% in New Jersey in, in earnings. The acute care hospital has what's called magnet designation and is ranked first in New Jersey by the LeapFrog Group for cost effectiveness, quality, and safety, and a top performer by the Joint Commission on Accreditation. The hospital also ranks in the top 1% of hospitals across the entire country in patient satisfaction. Becker's Hospital Review named the, uh, the hospital one of the 100 great hospitals in America. It is developing a $1.2 billion, 171-acre healthcare campus in Plainsboro. The campus opened in May of 2012 and includes a $522 million replacement for the acute care hospital. 
the organization received an unbelievable $172 million in philanthropic uh, support, probably perhaps by many of you folks right here. Before joining the Princeton Healthcare System, Mr. Radner was the senior executive at the Mainline Health in Pennsylvania and the Jefferson Health System. He holds a master's degree in public administration from Rutgers. He completed a graduate degree in French language and civilization at uh, the Sorbonne in Paris and earned a bachelor's degree in zoology and chemistry from the University of Maryland. Um, Mr. Abner's topic tonight is healthcare reform and its impact on care nationally as well as in New Jersey. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Barry Rabner.
it's gotten to the point, however, today, where I think that the last number I heard was like 16.5% of our gross domestic product is going toward the delivery of health care. That may not be a problem. To me, what the biggest problem is, and obviously I'm not an economist, for me the biggest problem is, as a country, we spend $3 trillion a year on health care, which I'm told is about the same size as the economy of France. So it's, uh, it's a big machine to have to move. So we've got three billion, there are three tri trillion, trillion. And there are folks who have uh, estimated that one trillion out of the three, a third of it, is wasted. I've read estimates that maybe it's $750 million. So I don't care what you think politically, I don't care what, what your values are, no one wants to burn a trillion dollars. Maybe it would be okay if our health indicators were terrific. But it turns out that when you look at the 20 wealthiest countries in the world, most of the indicators that you would look at to see how well we're doing our job were near or at the bottom. In fact, the only indicator that we are better at than anybody else in the world is that we spend more money than anyone on health care. Oh, so we spend the most, we have pretty shabby results overall when you just look at a population. And then you look at some of these other countries where there's uh, some pretty terrific results. And one of the things that I just became aware of that for me explains how things are going to change in, in the very near future is if you look at developed countries and ask and look to see how much money they spend on social services and on medical services and you combine it, we rank it uh, number 13. If for every dollar uh, a more successful country spends in health care, they spend two dollars in social services and are getting much better results than we are. We spend, I think it's at 90 cents uh, on social services and a dollar on health care. So, what needs to happen, and is, is, is happening now, finally, after all these years of predicting it, is uh, the insurance companies, we can talk about Medicare and the, the government later, but insurance companies are now paying us uh, either a bundled amount, so we get a fixed amount of money to take care of all of your health needs for a period of time, or maybe to take care of uh, all of the health needs that you have for a medi specific medical need that you have, like a a joint replacement. So all of a sudden we're not paying, just paying attention to the number of uh, services that we provide, but now we're trying to figure out how to manage your care from today when we have responsibility to keep you healthy all the way through for the rest of your life. And it's just not the way we think now. We start thinking about you when you show up at the hospital, maybe at the doctor's office, maybe in an outpatient, but we start thinking about you when you've got a problem. Uh, now, with the reimbursement changing, the incentives are finally aligned. So now we're trying to figure out, how do we keep you out of the hospital? So instead of my showing up and going, thank God all the beds are filled, I show up and go, oh my goodness, what are these people doing here? And there, there's so many terrific solutions that people are working on to figure out now in a much more serious way how to keep people healthy uh, at home. You know, I was talking to someone the other day, he said, you know, you can, person has diabetes, you can wait until they come to the hospital and remove their toes. Or you can buy them shoes that are appropriate for their health needs and avoid the problem. Person has congestive heart failure. You know, you can provide them with a scale to measure what their water gain is, which is an indicator of a problem at home. <coughs> And if they gain more weight than you think is reasonable, the scale calls the hospital, answered by a nurse, who's now going to call you and have a conversation and see what, what can be done to help. You know, there are all these incredibly smart people running around all these hospitals and, and academic medical centers and, and within the insurance companies as well, uh, who spent all this time thinking about how to take care of the problems when people and now we're finally going to have the right financial incentives to put the, and, and the resources to put in to try to figure out how to keep people healthy and keep them out of, out of the hospital. And thank goodness it's happening because 
we've run out of, you all have run out of money. You know, all the employers have turned to all the insurance companies and said, no mas. You know, we can't compete anymore internationally. Or it's difficult to compete internationally because so much of our costs are tied in uh, with healthcare and then part of the products that we're selling, so we're at a disadvantage. You know, the one thing I, I, I failed to mention that that's even more stunning to me is, so we spend three trillion, we burn a trillion, we don't have good results, and some estimates are that there are 100,000 people a year who die from a health care delivery based problem. That's equivalent to a 747 crashing every day. One 747 crashes and the whole fleet stops and everybody tries to figure out what's going on. And we've got a problem that's so significant and just and keeps going on. So and it's not for lack of trying, you know, and you know, the way I describe it, I, it, it's not an issue of the values of the organization, because whenever I say these things out loud, it sort of creeps me out a bit. But you know, you're looking at, at a system where the way care is delivered is a function of changes in technology, changes in pharmaceuticals, changes in how care is delivered, uh, and reimbursement. And of all of those factors, the one that changes the way care is delivered most or influences it the most is how it's reimbursed. You know, one of the things, another thing that's missing that I think is now coming into place is now that we'll have this in the, the financial incentives to manage care across the continuum. So it's keeping you healthy, getting you to go to the fitness center, supporting you through the visit to the doctor, maybe to the hospital, maybe for outpatient rehab or home care, uh, uh, maybe to back to a physician's office. But managing all of your needs across that continuum, uh, making sure that you get the right care at the right place in the most uh, cost-effective way uh, becomes uh, key to us. The problem is for us to do that today is almost impossible. Not that others haven't figured it out uh, when in areas of the country where the reimbursement changed a while ago. But it's still difficult. We don't have the information technology in place necessary for us to know what's going on with you. You know, we can't find all the information necessary to know about your care at each place that you go. It's a whole, and you, you've tried to put this information together for yourselves, I'm sure, trying to understand, trying to get the record from your doctor to the hospital, to the, to the home care nurse. Uh, we can't do it well either. And uh, we need an IT system that's robust enough to keep track of where everyone is, what their care is, uh, how much is being spent along the way, and whether everything is being done as absolutely efficiently as possible in order to get the, the costs down as well and to deliver on just better outcomes. So then we have the, so once we have the the information technology in place, we actually need people who know how to use it. You know, we have care managers now who do everything they can to focus on what your needs are when you're in the hospital and try to get you through and make sure you get all of the care that you need and then working on discharging you. But we don't have care managers who have the, the knowledge and the experience to manage all of the services that you need across the continuum. And they're being trained now. And uh, we'll, figure out, we'll figure out how to do that. Another thing that gets in the way of delivering great care now is everybody's being paid differently. Doctors get paid one way, hospitals get paid another, home care, long-term care, subacute care, rehab. Uh, there are all different incentives in place now. So getting the alignment that's necessary to focus on delivering the care the way it needs to be and overcoming these, these economic incentives is a challenge. And uh, as the reimbursement changes and we get aligned, it'll be a lot easier for the hospital, for example, and the physicians to sit down and not worry about how the money moves through the system and just worry about, uh, worry about the patient. The simplest example I can give, uh, the simplest example of what I just said is Medicare pays the hospital based on uh, what, your, what your problem is, and we get a lump sum. <coughs> Doctor may be paid for every time he visits you. The hospital's incentive is to get you healthy as quickly as possible and discharge you as quickly as possible and to make sure that you are healthy and that you don't come back to the hospital. 
because there is a penalty in place. The physician may be paid for every visit that he makes to you while you're in the hospital. So how aggressively do they manage length of stay? The hospital's incentive is, is different than that, and it's difficult. Uh, one of the ways that we could reduce costs you know, we've been, we've been as aggressive as anyone in, in trying to control our costs. There's huge pressure from Medicare in terms of their reimbursement, from commercial insurance companies. So uh, we do our best. But, you know, there's only so much you're going to save in terms of utility costs. You know, on our campus, we built a cogeneration plant that uses natural gas to produce steam, chilled water, electricity. We have solar cells. We've got turbines. We've got all kinds of really great features probably reduced our energy costs by maybe 25% compared to what they would have been if we were using conventional technology. So that's all, that's all really great. Well, we did it. It's done. Uh, by the way, it reduced our carbon footprint by maybe 50%. So it's got lots of benefits and a lot of redundancy uh, in terms of making sure that there's power when there's uh, storms out. But anyway, uh, we've reduced that cost. We have all these algorithms that we use for staffing efficiently. We're part of these group purchasing organizations that buy truckloads of condoms. You know, so our ability to buy stuff efficiently is uh, pretty well under control. But we continue to need to reduce our costs. And by the way, about 65, 70% of our costs are people, you know, human resources delivering care. So there are you know, huge limits to what you can do there. Where the biggest opportunity is for us is to deliver care more efficiently. You know, making sure that every service that's provided actually has a important clinical outcome, and that we're and and to do that, we've got to have clinical pathways that are based on research, not on habit, and making sure that everyone consistently follows the pathways when they apply. That requires another form of alignment with the physicians, uh, where there's an agreement to follow those pathways, to develop them, and uh, uh, to use the information technology that's available to access them and track the, the patient's progress. So that all needs to come into place now, but that's going to be a huge opportunity for us uh, to deliver much more uh, cost-effective care than we do now, so that everything that's done has, a, has, an evidence, uh, has evidence supporting it. And, and the biggest of all the, the economies in how we deliver and things that are going to really make a difference in the quality of the outcomes is paying attention to people before they come to the hospital and after they after they leave the hospital. You know, one of the things that that we did, Jesus, uh, back in 2003 when we did the planning for the new hospital was uh, because we we're fortunate enough to find this 171 acre site was to develop a uh, health campus. Uh, originally, we, it was enough, <laughs> the thought of building a new hospital was enough, but we had this great opportunity. And what we're doing now is, you, you've seen the hospital uh, out on Route 1, but we also have uh, a skilled nursing and subacute care facility that's providing care. We have another developer who is building an age-restricted independent living complex, probably about 300 or so units. We have Children's Hospital of Philadelphia providing outpatient pediatric services, someone else providing assisted living, another, they're not providing it, these are things that are under development, I'm, I'm not being clear. We have that being under development, the assisted living, adult daycare, child daycare, we have the medical office building, we have an area in the hospital that's designed, uh, an inpatient area for seniors. We have an area in the emergency department that's designed for seniors. We have acute rehab. And someday, soon, once these facilities are up and running, we're going to have this incredible opportunity to manage care across the continuum on the campus. And what I'm describing to you is special for us, not unique in the country, but not common yet. But imagine having the information technology, the physicians, the care managers, the financial alignment, partnership with an insurance company, with Medicare, so that we have all these resources that can be brought to bear, and home care, which obviously both the campus, and home care that can be brought to bear to provide care, again, at the right time, in the right place, uh, at, at, at the most appropriate cost, efficiently. 
Anybody here who's gone from the acute hospital to rehab knows the hassles associated with that, just as a, as a simple example. You know, you'll lose a day or two of care when you go from the hospital to the rehab hospital because we have to get the data over to them. And they may not trust the data and they may repeat some of the tests. Then they have scheduling issues so that the therapy doesn't get scheduled for the second day. And then there's a problem, your meal doesn't show up in the morning because that part of the system didn't quite work out right. And that's just common. And no matter how hard everybody works on it, it's so siloed, it's so disconnected that using the conventional, traditional ways of resolving the problem, like just working harder, just aren't good enough. But when we have that shared electronic platform and physicians who are providing care and managing it across the continuum with the help of the care managers, uh, we can do great things. And that's where the savings comes in. That's the kind of waste that needs to be taken out of the system. The fact that you're now in an acute rehab hospital doing nothing useful for a day or two. Uh, and if we can eliminate that so that the care either starts right away, uh, so that the care starts right away, is a huge benefit to everyone. So we're working on that. And uh, uh, it's not necessary that everything be on the same campus. We were just lucky to be able to create that. But if it's all within a reasonable distance, so that it, it, you can avail yourself of these different services and the folks who are involved can manage it can work out, uh, I think, terrifically well. Now, I mentioned the Children's Hospital of Philly, uh, Philadelphia on our campus. Uh, what we do with them, I think, is just a great model for how a lot of care needs to be delivered. So let me describe uh, how it came about that we're working with them and what they do. And, and imagine this in all different with all different clinical needs. So one of my models is no dabbling. So we look at all of our clinical services, and if we feel like we're dabbling, meaning we're not providing care as well as or better than other choices that folks have, we ought not to do it. So some years ago, before we moved to the new hospital, we were looking at our pediatric program, decided we were dabbling. We weren't impressed with it in any way, and we includes 60 pediatricians in the community, the nurses in the hospital, and, and, and others. So we had to make a decision. We have to close it, we have to fix it, or find a partner to help us fix it. So we decided we would give it a shot before closing it, and went out with requested proposals. Children's Hospital responded with a, terrific, uh, with a terrific proposal. And they started to provide hospitalists to the kids in the old hospital for the inpatient unit. They provided doctors for the neonatal intensive care unit, for the emergency department. They started to, uh, we would send nurses downtown to CHOP to learn different ways of taking care of kids. The doctors who were coming up helped us do a better job in the pharmacy and in the lab and in all the other areas that support the delivery of care. And I'm telling you without ex any exaggeration, within six months, everything got better. The quality, measurable quality of care improved enormously. And then, from a business standpoint, the volume increased and the profitability increased. So, the main thing, excellent patient care, followed by uh, strong financial performance, enabled us to actually redesign a new hospital in the middle, almost in the middle of construction, because the demand had increased so much. And it, it increased for only one reason, because the care was actually measurably better. But the, the, the smartest thing about it is, we have about 20 beds, and we take, as a non-physician, this is how I'll describe it to you, we take care of kids with these problems. And when they have these problems, they go to a children's hospital. You know, most of them choose to go to, to CHOP, but they may go to Robert Wood Johnson or any place else that, uh, wherever, they, wherever they prefer. Usually they end up going to CHOP. The process <laughs> for evaluating the kids in partnership with a very sophisticated, Children's Hospital, which you, no one will have, everyone will not have one in their community. You know, you've got to partner with the best. Our doctors in, in our hospital sharing data, talking to the physicians at CHOP while they're evaluating what's wrong with this kid in the emergency department, realizing that the need exceeds our ability, planning for the transport, and having it all done within an hour 
is extraordinary. And then care being provided at a, at a very tertiary environment. So hospitals like ours don't have to do everything for everyone. We're far from doing that. But when you can partner with specialty hospitals or partner with uh, major centers that provide uh, tertiary or quaternary more complex care, and making sure that you know the difference when you have a patient who needs one or the other, and having the arrangements in place to get them there promptly and safely is a beautiful thing. And we need to, we need to do more of that. We have programs now in the ED, uh, neuro, we have a robot, um, Jefferson, that will walk into your room and determine, help the team determine what your neurological problem is. It's a little spooky. I mean, it's, it's about my size. It's got a screen with a head about my size. And uh, it's got a camera that can actually uh, comes in. It, it introduces itself. It's a little creepy. But there's a nurse with it, so we get it moderates a little bit. But comes in, introduces itself, because there's a neurosurgeon 3 o'clock in the morning at Jefferson operating it with a joystick. And it's his face on the screen. And he asks some questions. The robot goes up to. You know, the TV screens in the room where there's data, you know, the telemetry on what's going on with the patient, and it looks at the screen. The nurse can, there's another screen in the room that has the electronic medical record. They can access the medical record, but they can also turn this, the camera to the medical record and look at that and get information. Then it has a conversation with the team and with the patient, with the family, if they're, if they're there. And it, it, he, it, whatever, it makes a decision. And it's extraordinary because everyone's not going to have an experienced neurosurgeon in their emergency department 24-7, 365. And so we have that robot. It's just a, a, another example. We were providing maternal and fetal medicine services, and we didn't think we were doing it well enough. There's a, a team of people from uh, the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania who are providing it at our place. You know, when we first set out on uh, creating a new hospital, we figured, you know, the great thing about living in central Jersey is within two hours, I don't think there's a need that you could have that can't be met, a uh, medical need. Um, so we didn't have any intention on duplicating service, you know, the most exotic services that you could get. So if you need a head transplant, you're going to have to go somewhere else. But the, the fact is, uh, we, our goal is to be able to take care of maybe 85% of what people need and do that as well, if not better than anyone else. And then make sure that when you have needs that exceed our ability, you go somewhere else. And that structure, uh, again, I'm just using us as, as, a, as an example, but that structure just works terrifically well. So you have, back to CHOP, when I was talking to the CEO there, he said, yeah, we have 600 beds, and we're evolving to the point where the entire building is an intensive care unit. And all the other needs that uh, kids have. Unfortunately, most kids are healthy, and when they're sick, it's not that complicated. But when it is, you have this incredible facility that's available to you. Otherwise, they'll be providing care in the community within the skills and experience of the facility. And everybody gets, uh, gets what they need uh, as close to home and, and as, uh, with, the right, with the right quality. One of the changes in reimbursement that you may uh, be, be becoming familiar with is uh, something that Horizon Blue Cross has been doing with their Omnia tiered products. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's an interesting idea. And in response to the pressure that Horizon feels, as do all the other commercial insurances, from employers to reduce their premiums, Horizon said, we have an idea. We'll reduce the premium by maybe 20%. We'll go to the hospital and say, uh, we'll make you <clears throat> tier one. And we're going to make other hospitals tier two. If you're tier one, there will be very, very low co-pays and deductibles. And if it's tier two, it'll be the opposite. It'll be very high co-pays and deductibles. So we'll end up steering patients from the tier two hospitals to the tier one. And in exchange for your agreeing to do that, you'll reduce your charges to us by 15%. Our margin, when everything is perfect, is maybe 3%. The average in the state of New Jersey is 2.5%. 
Last time I looked, there was a, what was it? There were maybe a quarter of the hospitals in the state were operating in the red. So somebody comes to you with a deal you just can't say no to. You know, cut your costs by 15%, or we're directing all the patients we can to somebody else. And we're happy to talk to you about it because we're satisfied with your costs today and the quality of your care and the level of your services. So they decided that roughly half the hospitals in the state are tier one, the other half are tier two, and then the same, everything I just said, they've also done with the doctors. So numbers are a little different, but about 60% of the doctors in the state are tier two, and the others uh, are tier one, pardon me. 60% of the doctors in the state are tier one, and the others are, are tier two all for the purpose of directing patients. So you can imagine that the employers seem happy. Employees have mixed feelings about it because it's sort of limiting. The, they can go wherever they want for care, but there's a huge financial hurdle to go to a tier two hospital or a tier two doctor. Um, the uh, the co-pays again for the tier two are really very high. On the, now, so it's, it's a strategy for reducing costs. It's going to have a huge impact. If they're successful, this is all new, but if they're successful, it's going to have a huge impact on how and where care is being delivered. Um, it's interesting because on the one hand, if you look at the uh, statewide data, you'll see that about half of the hospital beds are empty. Varies a lot from hospital to hospital, but on average, you know, the hospitals are running at about 50% occupancy. So, in theory, sort of, you can eliminate half the hospitals and there's still enough beds. Except it's such a random way of doing that. You know, it's not a planned process like some folks sitting there thinking about where there's excess capacity and where there's, uh, uh, where it meets minimum requirements. It's all driven by the, the process that I'm describing. So you end up with holes in where care is being delivered. And, uh, but on the third hand, I must be up to the third hand by now. On the third hand, the problem is if you don't act, what happens is you've got all these hospitals that don't have enough money to deliver care at the, at the level that's necessary. And hospitals die very, very slowly. You know, communities often feel a commitment to the institution. They come up with all ways of helping it. Hospitals come up with all ways of trying to manage their costs so that they can survive. So you have really poor performers in terms of clinical outcomes and patient satisfaction that continue to operate. And people continue to, to fight for them, which decreases the profitability of all of the hospitals. Because if, if some were to close, it would increase the efficiency of the ones that we're remaining. So we don't have a planned process for managing what I just described. We don't have a, a rational, in my opinion, a rational enough market-driven process for rationalizing what's going on. And if you just leave the status quo, you just watch you know, hospitals uh, deteriorate in terms of again, service quality, outcomes, financial performance. So we've got to do something about that. In my most, opt when I'm most optimistic, I think that the solution is going to come once we've got that information technology and we've got a mandate to share all of the clinical information that we have, because we've got a lot of clinical information, even with our old world uh, IT system. I think if we can start providing, if all of the hospitals and all of the doctors have to provide really accessible information on clinical outcomes, so you really knew how many, serve, how many of some procedure your doctor and how many of their patients had what we call unplanned returns to, serve, to, to the OR, or uh, blood use rates, or fatality rates, or other measures of, of uh, clinical outcomes. And you could access that on every doctor. If you could access that on every hospital, on every program, uh, real time, you could start making informed decisions. You know, my mother, who's 93 years old, she was a nurse for 60 years, when she makes a decision, it's She's a nurse for 60 years. She makes a decision on whether she likes the doctor. Nice, he's a nice, he's a nice boy. Everybody in her is a boy now, or a girl. He's a nice boy, so she uses him for care. He could be a serial murderer for all she knows, but she's just a, a sweet boy. She doesn't use any of that information. 
Or people use, uh, you know, they ask their friend, you know, who, who did your, who did the procedure on you? And they tell them, and then they say it was terrific. And just one day it dawned on me that when you ask somebody for that question, you realize you've never asked anybody who died. <laughs> so this is not good research. This is not a way to figure out where you want to get care. But a lot of people use that as their solution. We do this, we do market research all the time, we brand research and all these, all these other crazy things. And uh, uh, so we build this new hospital, we work so hard on delivering good care, we worry about people falling, and we worry about uh, do, doing surgery in the wrong site, and infections, and all these things. So we do this research, and it turns out that 45% of the people choose us because we're close to home. 18% of the people, I should be proud of this, don't repeat this. 18% of the people choose us because we're good looking. <laughs> Are you kidding? You know, I mean, we tried to create an environment that was pleasant and attractive and all those things, but you chose to come to the hospital because it's good looking? So that's 45 and two. I guess it was. Yeah. So it's a huge percentage of people who are making a decision in a way that they really ought not to. But it's a, it's a dilemma because you don't have easy access to data that you can really understand. Uh, to help make that decision. So I was trying to make this optimistic, and the optimistic part to me is it's coming, you know, and then you'll be able to make informed decisions. And that's how I think everything gets rationalized. So the lousy practitioners disappear, the lousy hospitals disappear, the, the, the better performers just get stronger all the time. And of the three choices, either a planned system or a, uh, a market system, uh, with, with its limits, I think the, the, the ideal system is uh, for us to be providing you with that kind of information so you can make real, real decisions. I, I know that my kids, who are 30, uh, 31, and 32, uh, they don't talk to people and they don't touch paper. They're otherwise normal, but they, <laughs> they, that's how they live. And uh, when they buy something, like a doctor's services, or a clinic visit, they do it all electronically. The weirdest thing that they do, and then I'll stop and take questions, the strangest thing that they do is they, they look at people who write comments about the doctor or the services that they, they, they receive. And you know, this one talks about how terrific it was, and then you, you scroll down to th three comments further down, they talk about how, thank God, I didn't die there. And it's just a little bit, I don't understand. They think they're making an informed decision, using this cockamamie information. So I'm, I'm optimistic that there will be requirements that we do have to collect standardized information, share it, and make it, make it understandable. And then, then we'll be where we need to be. Changing the way we get reimbursed so that we're responsible for the continuum of care instead of being incented every morning to provide, to do piecework, uh, creating the alignment between the physicians, the hospitals, the insurance companies and the patients will all come together to make something great happen. And I see it happening. Last point. I just see it happening. It's not like the nonsense I was saying 20 years ago that it's coming because we can't afford to continue to go the way we are now. It's coming. <clears throat> In the contracts we have with, oh, so about half of our patients are insured by uh, commercial insurance. And most of that is Aetna and Horizon. And then there's dozens of others. Our contracts with those payers are three years long, and in either the second or third year of the existing contracts, we're going to be paid differently, and in a more logical way like I've uh, been describing. Medicare, in another two years, is expecting 50% of the hospitals to be providing care under what they call alternative payment mechanisms, which really just comes down to getting paid to do it in a way like I was just describing. Well, that's like 90% of the people we take care of. So we have dates, and it's clear what the expectations are going to be. So it's coming. It's here, just uh, two or three years down the road. Hopefully, we'll keep up with it and, uh, and do a good job. So that's the story about what it's like in the hospital. Can I answer any questions, clarify anything I said? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Coast and the A1 of which is Tier 1 and one which is Tier 2. Right. They're both big. Yeah. Both <laughs> well, that's, you're halfway there. <laughs> so, right. how is this Tier 1, Tier 2 going to benefit anybody but the insurance company? <clears throat> I would have summarized it the way you did, but the more I thought about it, uh, it, it's really more being driven by the employers than it is by the insurance companies. Yeah, well, so just people in general, okay. It's, it, it reduces your choice, so from that standpoint alone, I think it's it's less, you know, you can take a more global look, uh, a more global approach and view it as a way of reducing healthcare costs, which will reduce the price of goods and services, which will help the economy, which helps all of us. But that's sort of, that's pretty far down the road. But it doesn't, you know, it'll help, it'll help the employer reduce premiums. It'll, uh, and to the degree that has any value to employers, employees, it's modest. It's really economically driven, not, not clinically driven. I'm still I'm concerned that Tier 2 is going to have a bad reputation. Yeah, and there's... Lose hospitals. I think that both of your comments are right. I think there, not I think, there's uh, litigation behind <laughs> this. There's, uh, there's politics involved now. There, mm -hmm. Courts are involved. It, if you you can start, you'll start seeing art, not articles, but uh, paid advertorial in, in newspapers where the folks who are tiered to are uh, making the arguments that that you're making. So we'll see if they prevail. You know, you still, as an employer, not spend too much time on it, but as an employer, you have to turn to your employees and tell them, you know, if you want to go to Philly or New York or Baltimore for care, they're all tiered two. So if you want to go to Memorial Sloan Kettering or Children's Hospital for Philly or Hospital for Special Surgery, it's all tier two. I don't know how easy it's going to be to, to, tell, to tell an employee that if their kid, you know, God forbid, has cancer, that they can't go to Chop or Sloan. So we'll see how successful they are, but yes, sir. One of the biggest ways that most people interface with the hospital is all this marketing whether advertisements on television or lecture series. Or not, uh, you don't like Pepe south of the border when you go down not Route 1 and 95 with the uh, old ones? So is there more marketing now? Is there different marketing now? I mean, why all of a sudden, I mean, look at the hospital. I mean, you walk into the hospital and it's gorgeous. I mean, that's got to be part marketing. There's just so much. That, that, that it is part of marketing, for sure. Why is it? Why has it changed? How has it changed? Yeah. Uh, What's the benefit? Um, I don't, I can't tell you whether, just sticking with New Jersey, I can't tell you whether more or less money is being spent uh, in marketing. I suspect there is because there are more, because of the number of hospitals that are distressed and the amount of competition that's forming. You know, take a step back. So I mentioned there are 73 hospitals in the state. There used to be 142. Uh, so obviously uh, a lot of closed. 73 now. Uh, most of them, all but maybe I think six, are now part of larger healthcare systems. Uh, and these systems are, are now. You know, I used to think we were big at you know 400, 450 million dollars. Still sounds like a huge amount of money to me. But now we're talking about five, six, eight billion dollar systems. And uh, they're now marketing against each other. Hospitals that are in trouble financially trying to still depend on volume, you know, back to my dashboard in the morning. So they're trying to address their, their volume problems by taking whatever money they have left and doing more in marketing. Uh, much more of the marketing budget, sort of off your point a bit, but much more of the marketing budget is being spent on uh, uh, social media and electronic forms of communicating. So it, that's helped in terms of managing some of the costs. But you know, the business side of healthcare is like any other business, and there's just competition, and competition for patients. Do, uh, 
how much uh, does a person really come up with a rational reason as to what hospital he's going to go to? Are you marketing to someone that's not going to pay any attention to, uh, you know, as Mark mentioned earlier, about 44% go because it's, you know, Close dirty, yeah, and, and X percent do it because you look pretty, whatever. Well, listen that I look pretty, but we got it. And you live pretty. Hospital well, so, gorgeous. Yeah. So, so you're doing all this marketing, and a very few, a small percentage of them are going to pay any attention to it in terms of make, uh, making the decision. If you say that, uh, right. you know, you've got a you know, good-looking uh, physician there, I don't care if he's good-looking or not. I mean, he's down to, I happen to live about a mile from a hospital. I mean, that's what I'm going to go to. So I all this money on marketing. For, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. So for, for me, the question applies to all businesses that do marketing. You know, how you're sort of asking, how well do you think you focused your message, and how well do you think, how impactful do you think that message is in changing people's behavior? And it's sort of a, a, just a general question, and and we think it's uh, we think it does move people. You know, it's hard for me to use us as the as an example because we 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 do spend a lot of money in marketing, and we built a new building. We've done a whole a whole host of things, and we've had the largest increase in inpatient utilization, outpatient, and ED of any hospital in the state in the last year. I don't know why, you know, because so many things have changed at the same time. The location itself may, may, you can probably attribute most of that to the change in location. I don't know how much is due, really due to marketing, how much is due to delivering better care, uh, how much is due to the fact that we have more physicians who are aligned with us and are directing their patients to us. So I don't, I don't know. It's, you know, I always wondered if Coke stopped advertising, would they still, would they run out of people drinking Coke? Yes. Yeah, you mentioned the examples of pediatrics and like children's hospital. Are there other areas you're looking at of a similar model? Um, well, the most recent one was what I mentioned with uh, Jefferson in uh, neurosurgery in the, in the ED. And the one with, with CHOP. You know, I had had a conversation for a year and a half with uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering because I think they do some special things. Uh, and we couldn't, we couldn't agree on what the best thing to do for, for the people in our service area is. Uh, I think there's more that we can do to uh, provide more comprehensive, better care in cancer. I think there's more that we can do uh, in cardiology. And uh, I think the best way for us to do that is with people who are really great at doing those things. It's too hard to create it on our own. You know, it's, so. good, it's a good model. It is, right? And, and, and it, it, it's uh, it, not always a good model. There aren't a lot of good alternatives to it, you know, at least not that we've been able to, to be successful with. You're waving at me, so. I was going to say, uh, maybe one small question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, my question has to do with crossing state borders. I know that it's yeah. a big issue of the insurance, and we're very close to the there, and you have alliances with Trump, uh, et cetera. Has a very big problem paying uh, across border physicians, particularly. And I understand that uh, a regional hospital such as Princeton can't have an electronic medical record system that is the same as jobs because it's too expensive for regional hospitals. How do you deal with the state line yeah. issue? Uh, just to clear one thing up, we, could, uh, we will be able to solve the, the information technology problem. And we'll, uh, we'll be able to have the capacity that we need by hook or by crook. So we'll get the IT thing done. But your, your point about uh, crossing state yeah, lines. It takes days. Pardon me? It takes days to get records to get this. Um, oh. Eat. I mean, it's crazy. You're right. And uh, with an investment of $30 million, we'll be able to deal with that. So, yeah. And we will, because it's necessary. It's not, a, it's not an option. And here I am talking about reducing costs. And, it's not an option, we're going to spend it on that because it's necessary. Uh, but the issue about getting care across state lines uh, is ridiculous to me. Because, first of all, I just hate anything that limits 
my choices or anybody's choices. Hell, the only thing that makes my hospital better, frankly, is competition. And I'm not, <laughs> you know, though we politically, and I usually don't talk about it, but it is competition. When I find out that some other hospital's lab gets its work done in three hours, then I can't sleep until I get it done in two hours. You know, that's a big deal. And there's terrific care provided outside the state. It needs to be accessible to everyone. It'll keep the quality of, it'll only contribute to improving the quality of care here as long as everybody in the state has to compete to, to make their care better. Uh, there are bar artificial barriers that are being thrown up, the, the one example I gave, but there are more, and some of them are political, but there are barriers that are being thrown up to limit people's ability to access care outside the state. And New Jersey, you, you know, many of you know better than I do, you know, it's a quirky kind of place. We've grown to be very dependent in some ways on uh, resources in New York and Philadelphia. And I don't want to be limited in accessing them. So I'm all for the problem of having to compete against uh, other hospitals and other caregivers. Well, some is with insurance companies. Some is with some legislators. I don't know if some of you remember, gosh, it was a couple of years ago, where the state wanted to limit all state employees to uh, care provided within the state. Now, it was overcome, but it'll happen again. You know, cause, because it'll be in the self-interest of some of the hospitals to, to increase the demand for their services by limiting your access to services outside the state. Thank you. Thank you.